Housing is shaping up to be a big election issue with prices rising at record speeds over the past 12 months. The Australian property market has now surpassed $9 trillion in value, latest figures show. But how can young home buyers afford it? Well, the Prime Minister says the government is giving first-time buyers a leg up with grants to build or buy homes and enabling them to get loans with deposits of just 2 to 5%. Since the last election, we have put over 300,000 Australians into a home. 300,000. It's an extraordinary achievement. That is is the result of having the right mix of policies. But with interest rates at record lows, prices just keep going up and a massive intergenerational wealth divide keeps growing too. House prices across Australia have risen over the past 12 months by 21% in our capital cities. But in regional Australia, property prices have risen by 25% over the past 12 months and are now much closer to the level seen in capital cities than they have been for a very long time. Saul Leslake is an independent economist and vice chancellor's fellow at the University of Tasmania. You look at the distribution of wealth across generations, the proportion of total household wealth held by households where the reference person, as they say in the statistics, is age 65 or over, has risen from 25% in 2003-04 to 33% in 2017-18, which is the most recent survey that the AABS has published. That's an eight percentage point increase in the share of household wealth owned by households aged 65 or over. And that's an extraordinary increase in a period of 15 years. So uh, we've seen a significant increase in intergenerational inequity driven largely by the continued escalation in house prices. And of course, the people who've missed out most are those younger Australians who've been unable to get into the property market at the same stage of their lives as their parents or grandparents. So although the overall home ownership rate hasn't declined an enormous amount, over the last 50 or so years, it's gone from about 72% to 65% over that period. Among households aged between 25 and 34, the home ownership rate has dropped by 11 percentage points since the early 1990s. Even among households aged between 45 and 54, the home ownership rate has dropped by 9 percentage points over the last 30 years. Uh, it's really only been among households aged over 55 where the home ownership rate has either been stable or gone up slightly, they're the ones who benefited from the rapid escalation of house prices while their children and grandchildren increasingly have missed out. You'd think those children and grandchildren might be out on the streets protesting, but they're not. Um, well, uh, yes, I've, I've said that. I'm genuinely surprised that there isn't more anger among younger Australians about the way in which the property market has effectively been rigged by their parents and grandparents' generations to their detriment. Have governments even tried to bridge that generational wealth gap? Well, no, they haven't. Whenever property prices have looked as though they might fall, something which would probably help younger people who are looking to get into the market for the first time, governments react by giving increased first homeowner grants on what are usually more generous terms conditions, and the Reserve Bank cuts interest rates. And the effect of that is to put house prices back on an upward trajectory again. We've got more than 50 years of evidence now that first homeowner grants do nothing to increase the home ownership rate. Uh, they inflate property prices. And what this has done has been to create a perception on the part of property owners that the government will do whatever it takes to stop property prices from falling nationwide. And that's probably encouraged more people to borrow money in order to buy properties as investments than would have been the case otherwise. What's the political calculus there, Saul? Because, you know, presumably politicians are quite cognizant that young voters coming up are, are going to be somewhat exercised by the situation they find themselves in, is there just more votes in, in older homeowners? Well, at the risk of sounding cynical, I think the answer to that's yes. And for all the crocodile tears that politicians shared from time to time about the difficulties faced by especially younger Australians getting their first foot on the property ladder, they also know that in any year, typically there are only about a hundred to 120,000 of them and maybe another two or 300,000 who would have liked to join them but haven't been able to. But at the same time, politicians know that there are 11 million Australians who own one property. Within that, there are at least 2 million who own two or more properties. And the last thing that those 11 million Australians want governments to do is anything that restrains the rate of property isolation. So that's why they continue to favour policies that keep upward pressure on house prices, other than say that it's another level of government that ought to be doing something. Don't blame us for it. Now, um, there is a federal government inquiry into housing affordability and supply going 
going on at the moment. The shelves are not lacking in inquiry reports into housing in this country. So will this one deliver any solutions and what should those solutions look like? Well, this inquiry by the House of Representatives Standing Committee on Tax and Revenue has been given terms of reference which more or less oblige you to find that the main solution to the problems of deteriorating housing affordability and falling home ownership rates are increased supply of housing and, hey, isn't it a pity, but that's the responsibility of state and local government, so there's not much that the federal government can do about it. I think increasing housing supply is part of the answer, but I know that in the five years prior to the onset of COVID, Australia had been adding an average of more than 200,000 new dwellings a year to the stock of housing, which is about 35% more than the average over the previous 15 to 25 years without doing anything obvious to increase home ownership rates or to restrain house price inflation. So while there are things that could be done, including governments themselves at the federal and state level, spending more on increasing the supply of social housing, but in my view, that's only a parcel solution. And we also ought to be looking at reducing government policies that serve only to inflate the demand for housing. And most of those policies are at the federal level, including the tax preferences for property investment that I think it's important to emphasise have been reduced by conservative governments in other countries. So, for example, the American version of negative gearing was abolished by the Reagan administration in 1986. The UK variant of negative gearing was abolished about five years ago by the conservative government of then Prime Minister David Cameron. So wanting tax preferences for property investors to be scaled back or abolished is not the exclusive preserve of left of centre governments in countries with political systems similar to ours. It's been done at least as often by right of centre governments similar to our coalition governments. And, you know, the interesting thing is that the sky has not fallen in. So, Saul, if we continue on the trajectory we are on, you know, this big generational wealth divide continuing to grow, what's the impact of that longer term um, socially and economically? Well, the first thing, I guess, is that the inequities in the distribution of wealth across generations will increase over time. But perhaps more importantly, Australia's retirement income system is premised on an unstated assumption that the vast majority of retirees will have close to zero housing costs because they will, by the time they get to retirement, own their own homes outright and thus can live comfortably on what by international standards is a relatively low pension and for what historically has been the small proportion of Australians who haven't been able to achieve home ownership by the time they reach retirement age, they'd be living in social housing where their rents were fixed as a relatively low proportion of them. Well, neither of those things are going to be so true over time because an increasing proportion of Australians will get a retirement never having owned their own home and will have to live in the private market where their security of tenure is less and where rents represent a much higher portion of their incomes. And even among those Australians who are able to become homeowners during their working lifetimes, an increasing proportion of them will reach retirement without having paid off their mortgage. Quite rationally, they will then use their superannuation payouts to pay off their mortgage and will then become dependent on the age pension, which kind of defeats one of the principal purposes of compulsory superannuation. Independent economist Saul Eslake.